Welcome back to Man vs. Meeple. We have a Kickstarter preview for a game called Lincoln. This one is from Martin Wallace and PSC Games. This is a two-player game that doesn't really recreate, historically, the battle between the North and the South, but it is a really, really interesting battle. Yeah, so it kind of represents the um, the tug of war that goes on between the, the specific locations that Lincoln fought over. So it's a really unique game, number one. It's it's not a, a deck builder, although you'll be adding cards to your deck um, when you run out. It's more of a what he labels as a deck deconstruction because <laughs> you're going to be playing units on the board. And when you play the higher value units, you're choosing twos and your threes, you're actually taking those cards and removing them from the game. So your deck will start to get smaller. One of the other very cool aspects of the game is that it's completely asymmetrical. So you have the north and you have the south. And the north will start off very weak with a lot of their units and a lot of their abilities. But as they add new cards into their deck through the course of the game, they become stronger and stronger while the south becomes weaker and weaker. Yeah, the variable starting sort of positions, if you will, for both sides definitely give that asymmetric feel. Now, the turn-to-turn -turn, uh, games, is you're going to be taking a lot of the same or similar types of actions. But like Jeremy said, you start in very, very different states. Yeah. And I don't mean states in the, in yeah. the country. So there's a, a lot of different win conditions and lose conditions. So those two are, are very asymmetrical in the way that you play. The Norse's main goal is to gain victory points round after round. Now, there's no real rounds in the game. However, a round is signified when the North player has used all their cards. They're going to start with an X number of cards in their deck. And they're going to be using these cards to take actions. When they run out of cards, they're actually going to introduce another deck into their discard pile. And they're going to shuffle those up. Again, any of the cards they remove from the game are gone. They can't add those back in. And when they go through that deck they have to meet a certain number of victory points the first time they go through it, and that's two. A number of the locations on the board have victory points tied into them. They're typically, well, they're always southern locations. So right. you have to invade and you have to make progress into those southern states in order to gain victory points. If you don't have two victory points by the time you go through your deck the first time, the Confederate side wins. And the second time that you go through your deck, you're going to be introducing an even stronger deck into it. And if you don't have five victory points by then, the southern state wins. <laughs> the third time you go through it signifies just the flat out end of the game. And by then, the north has to have 12 victory points. These aren't tokens. Again, it's just controlling those locations on the board. Right, that tug of war can come into play because he can have some, you know, the, the north can have so many points one round, but the next round he might have fewer because the confederate side has pushed into some of those locations or taken them back. Uh, there's some other ways to to, um, to win the game. Now, there are three main locations in the game that are supply routes. These are the locations that you have to tie into to these railroad routes in order to build or put new units on the board. If you lose these, you're going to lose the game. So one of the ways is if the northern player loses Washington. This is their only supply route in the game. If the Confederate states come in and take that control of it, the southern states win. Now, there's two locations being Richmond and Vicksburg, that if the North is able to invade and control, the, the only units in there are his units, then he would win. So there's actually one more way that the game can end. Through, the, through battles and through card play, the European nations are going to be looking at the struggle <clears throat> in the Americas. If this marker ever makes it all the way down, the Confederate side will win as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of ways that the Confederate side can win, and it's really the North struggling round after round trying to make progress to the board. Right, now that you mentioned this track, it's sitting here alongside another track here. There's the Europe track that Jeremy just described, and that's going to go back and forth for, through a variety of ways. Through battles, there are cards that you can simply play to move that up and down. And then there's the blockade track. The blockade is also yet another one of those tug-of-war aspects to the game. This is going to move back and forth, but here's what happens. At the high side, the Confederate side is going to have a five-card hand limit. Mm -hmm. On the low side, He's going to have only a three card hand limit, hand limit, plus those are also more victory points that the Union side can earn. Yeah, so all of the cards in the game are variable use. They have a yeah. variety of ways that you can use the cards. Let's talk briefly about the anatomy of the card because the entire game is driven by card play. On your turn, you're allowed to take two actions. The actions are by the cards that you have in front of you. Most of the cards have at the top are going to have icons on them. These show you what you can introduce or do during that turn. 
Most of them are geared around the units. You have level one, level two, and level three units. These are gonna actually be placed into locations that you control or have routes to areas that are controlled by you. Typically, whenever you play these units, you have to either just play a unit straight out or some of the units require you to discard an X number of cards from your hand to your discard pile. Now the trick here is this is the deck deconstruction portion of the game. If you play a level one unit, you just play it to one of those locations that you control and the card that you use goes to your discard. Any level two and any level three that you play ever in the game are thrown out of the game permanently. So you have to make decisions. Do I use the card to deploy new units to the board or do I use it from one of the other options below? I think it's interesting too because it really thematically it represents the fact that any side of any war doesn't have an unlimited supply of people right. uh, or forces. So as you get these out on the board, they leave your hand. So the interesting thing about those extra decks too is the union side gets more and more because as their resources build in terms of people that are joining that side, uh, it grows. Whereas the Confederate side seems to wane a little bit in that respect. Absolutely. Two more icons that you could possibly see at the top. One of them is uh, tied directly to the European track. Again, you can discard an X number of cards to move that one space north or south, depending on which side of the board you're sitting on. And then the other one is for the blockade. Again, uh, you have to discard an X number of cards. This card goes to your discard, and then you get to move this one space. Now, there's a whole bunch of other icons and actions that could possibly be on the bottom of the cards as well. Yeah, I mean, some of those are going to be, mostly you're going to see on almost every card, this little star icon. That's going to come into play during battles. We'll talk about that in a second. But the other one that you're going to be looking for quite a bit is this little icon of a train. This is going to let you move. So if you play a card this way, you can simply move. Now, there's two different ways to move. You can move all of your units from one location with one of those cards to an adjacent location via one of the train tracks. Mm -hmm. So you can move them all at once. Or you can choose any one unit and move that as far as you want to another controlled location as long as it's connected by controlled locations. And when we say controlled locations, that's a con uh, location controlled by you. Yeah. Or at the beginning of the game, any location that is Your uh, color, this basically. beige color yeah. is a Confederate, the blue is the Union, so those are controlled. The last possible icon is the ship icon. Now, this is different than the one that you see on top that moves the blockade marker. This is actually ship movement that is allowed by the northern states and only the northern states. He has a possibility of moving anything out of Washington and Washington only to any of these three port states to invade by sea, which is really unique for the northern players. Right. It gives the northern players that opportunity because obviously as units shift around this board, there's some chances that come into play where you can kind of sneak in behind enemy lines, so to speak, and get into places like Vicksburg. Right. Let's talk about the board itself. As we said, a lot of these locations are connected by train tracks. You're going to see victory points on several of these southern states. That's because the north is trying to control these in order to gain victory points by the time that they get rid of their deck, um, an X number, which I already spoke about. You're also going to see plus numbers on a number of these as well. These are defensive bonuses that the controlling state will gain if it's invaded by the other state. So for instance, if you were to invade from Manassas into Washington, I would get whatever units are in this plus a four right. because you invaded by that way. Now, some of them have multiple icons, meaning if you come in from different directions, they give different bonuses for them. One of the things to note that you can never gain those bonuses as the other player caller if you control that location. So it's only for the native location that controls that inherently. Yeah, and before we get into, I and mean, we've kind of discussed through the cards themselves, a lot of the actions you'll take, but we'll talk about those more in a second. The last thing I want to say about everything we have in front of us, this board, if you couldn't tell already, it's really cool that it's divided in two and the Union side faces them yeah. and the Confederate side faces them. So you're able to really literally sit across from each other and play this like a good strategic game. Yeah, one thing we did forget to mention too is that the southern states has a fort icon on the top of some of their cards. So they do have a token yes. that allows them to place permanent fortifications in the south, which just give them a plus str three strength. Those can't be moved. They're locked into those locations once they're built. All right, so the game is incredibly simple to play. The north player from start to the end of the game will always have six cards at the start of the round or start of their turn. They're going to start first. The southern states will have a maximum of five that will decrease as the game progresses. So on my turn, I look at my six cards. I get to decide any two actions that I want to take. There's six possible actions. I'll talk about the easiest first. That's passing. You don't do anything. You simply <laughs> say, I want to pass. 
Another action is to just discard a card. Say you didn't want to play a card, but you want to cycle through your deck faster, possibly to get to one of these other better cards being introduced to your deck. You just discard that card, it goes away. Those are two of the actions. Right. One of the main actions is to actually take an action from a card. And we've talked about several of the different icons. Let's talk about them, how they actually work. So if I wanted to introduce this to army, it would require me to discard one card from my hand. Say I chose this one, it goes to my discard pile. This card that I use to introduce the two is removed from the game. And then I get to put this in any control location that I have. Control locations are places that I have presence and no other uh, South doesn't have presence or a place that like Gettysburg here, which is my caller and you're right. not in there. So I could put it here or any one of these other locations. So that's introducing an army unit. Yeah, and the same thing is going to happen with a three. And like we said earlier, if you deploy a one, you don't have to get rid of that card for the rest of the game. Mm -hmm. So another thing, and we didn't talk about this when we talked about the cards themselves, are a lot of them have actions at the bottom yeah. of the card. These often can be different things. Some of them are actions that you use as one of these two actions. Some of them are benefits that you can kind of sneak in and play in different times. But when mm -hmm. you're using it as an action, you simply play the card and take that action. It's going to do a variety of different things. Usually, they're sort of enhanced versions of the other things you can do, some sort of sneaky tactics that allow you to make a big movement instead of just your standard movement, that sort of thing. Right. One of the other things you can do is movement. Uh, as we said, some of these cards will have a movement icon on them. You just get rid of that card, and then you get to move units, as David uh, previously had said. And the last thing you could do is sometimes after combat, units will remain in that particular location. You can also just declare an attack there. Now, attacks will always happen if you move into an opposing location. So, say I did a movement from this location with these two guys into here. The first thing that happens is, you're gonna notice each of these locations has two sides to them. When, they're, uh, when you move into a location, that defensive side's gonna move up to combat you, right? All right, so the next thing that happens is the attacking player has to play one of their cards from their hand. As uh, as we previously said, some of these cards will have leadership bonuses on them, which are just strength bonuses that you'll be able to use. They're played in secret and they're played face down. The opposing side or the defending side then has a choice. Do they want to stay and fight or do they want to withdraw? If they choose to withdraw, no battle happens and they simply just recede to the other side of that location. If they choose to battle, then they have an option. Right. If they withdraw in future turns, that's going to be a place where you can take the action of initiating another battle. But if they fight, they have the chance, the defending team, to basically play one of their cards down as well. This is going to have a leadership bonus or mm -hmm. not. Right. And you flip those over and add up the values. The other thing that I'd mentioned before is some of the cards have those actions at the bottom. Some of those are benefits or hidden actions. And those can come into play right before people reveal their cards. I might be able to play a card that brings two more of my units that are connected up into that location so you can really sort of turn the tides of the battle mm -hmm. without the other player really expecting it. Right. So once they just make that decision, both players are going to reveal them and then add them up. Highest strength wins. If there is a tie, the defender always wins. If you are the winner, you have to reduce half of the number of counters you have rounded down. So in this case, if I won, I'd have to lose one counter. If you are the loser, you have to lose half your counters rounded up. And that, so obviously there's a, there's a benefit for winning in those locations. The other huge benefit is the loser has to move their European track, the number of counters they lost in the opposite player's right. direction. So if I made them lose four counters, I would move one, two, three, four in my direction. So that can be huge, especially if you have a large number of units in a specific location. Yeah, it's really interesting because you can you want to take that into consideration when you're building up this massive force against another massive force because when two massive armies face each other, that track is going to move yeah. significantly. Potentially three, maybe even four spaces in some cases. Uh, in the favor of one of the two sides. Yeah, one of the things to note too, say David had withdrawn to this location, once you are locked in a location specifically, you can't deploy to that area anymore. You can only deploy to areas that you control. In this case, you're gonna have to be moving units in right. to try to gain advantage of those areas. And again, we already talked about the winning conditions. There's a lot of different ways to win or lose this game. It takes about 90 to 120 minutes, depending upon how the game progresses. Yeah, the game can really progress very, very differently. In yeah. fact, I could see this game lasting much shorter than 90 minutes, depending Absolutely. on how things happen. Because yeah. 
you have to pay attention to the fact that there's a lot of different win conditions, some different lose conditions, and make sure that no one's sneaking in the win in one of those categories. Yeah, there's a really cool tug of war to the game too. Like there's a, there's a potential for players to go heavy in one location while you sneak through a different location. There's a potential to do a lot of different things on the European track, the blockade track. As David previously said, if you have a large amount of armies in one particular area and you lose that battle, and you're progressing everywhere else, it can swing the tide of the game instantly. So you have to be very careful on where you deploy, which units you deploy, which cards you're actually getting rid of in the deck deconstruction of it, how fast you want to go through your deck, because if you go through it too quickly and you don't have control of two locations or five locations or 12 locations or victory points right. at the end of the game, you're going to lose. So there's a lot of things to balance there. And as a North player, that's a very interesting thing that you have to juggle. Yeah, the North player, it's, it's, it's interesting. It is asymmetric, and I would say... The North player has a unique challenge ahead of them, for mm -hmm. sure. They start out weak where the Confederate starts out strong. So when, when we've played, there's been times where the Confederate army will rush yeah. and take advantage of sort of the power that they have at the beginning of the game. And it kind of, you know, the Union side is a little on their, on their heels. Yeah. If you wait too long, it beco slowly becomes better and easier, if you will, for the Union side. So... It's an interesting way that you can approach this game every time. Yeah. And again, if you've played games, this game is nothing like Seven Wonders Duel. No. However, if you like games that have that sort of two-player head-to-head aspect where I could win this way, I could win this way, I might lose these three ways, yeah. this has that same sort of feel for yeah. sure. Very cool game from Martin Wallace and PSC Games. Two player only, 90 to 120 minutes. If you guys have any questions about the game, make them in the comments below. Subscribe to us, follow us on Twitter, and everything else that we do, and we will catch you guys next time. Bye-bye.